Good morning. This is a continuation of our series for the uh, Unmanned Aircraft Systems Technical Certificate at Southern Crescent. And this is the final course, uh, just a, re a, view, a review course in preparation for the actual FA written exam. Now, uh, the effects of weather on a uh, UAS, th this should sound very familiar to most of us because we've just finished a, an eight-week segment on weather and national airspace system. But, however, we're going to do a quick review, hopefully it's a quick review, on the effects of weather on small aircraft. The FAA testing guide about this section of the test, it says this, to, uh, the purpose of this test is to determine that the applicant is knowledgeable in the flight effects of weather on performance and is able to demonstrate a thorough knowledge of density altitude, wind and currents, atmospheric stability, pressure and temperature, air masses, thunderstorms and microburst, icing, hail, fog, uh, ceiling invisibility, and lightning. So pretty, pretty extensive list here, and I'm going to try to get through it in about 30 minutes. So we'll see. All right, so we'll start out with the uh, uh, density altitude discussion. Uh, as you see in this picture, a uh, great little picture showing that, uh, again, air has weight. It, it seems weightless to us, but it does have weight. And as you get to the bottom of this air column, going from the top of the atmosphere to sea level, uh, in some places like Death Valley, it's below sea level, but at any rate, it gets thicker as we get lower. And, and what's that got to do with us? That's a huge concept, but as what it has to do with drones or aircraft, for that matter, is that propellers or wings will have be more efficient when you have thicker air. So uh, would take less power to fly or your performance would be better with higher atmospheric pressure. When we say higher pressure, we're talking about atmospheric pressure. So, okay, we recall that. Um, we can add to that, as you can see the little picture of the molecules, uh, atoms are pressing down on this guy at the bottom of the mountain, right? The molecules are closer together. As we uh, increase the temperature, a similar thing happens as the air molecules are bumping around faster and they move further apart, air gets thinner as temperature increases. And that has to do with performance as well because a thinner air is, well, has a lower pressure. So the propeller blades or the wings will have to work harder to produce the same amount of lift as it would have been if the temperature was cooler. That's why we care about um, density altitude. So after talking a little bit about density altitude, of course it leads right into this uh, concept of performance, the performance of an aircraft or a drone. It's, a drone is an aircraft. Um, Performance uh, is simply a term used to describe the ability of an aircraft to uh, accomplish certain things, whatever thing you want it to accomplish, which is to fly, most likely, or carry a payload or take pictures, whatever. Carry a payload. Payload is the camera in the case of taking photographs or mapping information. Um, so, as previously discussed, the density altitude or the pressure altitude around their drone has a, a pretty big effect on its ability to fly. And so does temperature as well. Mm -hmm. And as we climb higher, as the air gets thinner, our performance decreases as we climb higher as well. Okay, so when we talk about performance of an aircraft, we have to start to uh, at least consider the standard pressures and standard temperatures. And that's simply a way, a common reference point for manufacturers to be able to uh, judge what for us as well to judge how well our aircraft will perform on any particular day because temperature change, pressure change, um, weather systems moving through and the atmosphere pressure will change or we may be flying on the top of a mountain instead of down at sea level, pressure is going to change so we need some kind of a standard, right? Uh, the standard conditions as you can see here, 29.92 inches of mercury or 15 degrees C are the standard conditions which are the basis for aircraft performance data. Now most of our drones over there at this point are still basically recreational drones so there's not a whole lot of performance data out there but as we as you graduate and move into the industry you'll be flying drones that do have 
performance data that you'll have to check with the uh, check to see whether or not today is a good day to fly, basically. <laughs> we know that if, the, if it's cloudy weather, if there's not enough visibility, it's not a good day to fly. But if it's uh, 100 degrees temperature outside, perhaps you won't be able to pick up that package and deliver it. Anyway, these are the uh, standards, 29.92 inches of mercury and 15 degrees C. Anything warmer than 15 degrees C means the air is thinner. Anything colder than 15 degrees, uh, we can uh, assume that the performance of your drone will be better than a standard day. The same with pressure as well. As the air is thinner, uh, we will have a reduction in performance. Now, since weather condition stations are located all around the globe, local bar barometric pressures, that's 2992, uh, are converted to a sea level pressure to provide a standard for records and reports. Um, so basically each station, you don't really need to know this, I'm going to tell you anyway, but uh, each station converts its barometric pressure by adding approximately one inch of mercury to every thousand feet of elevation above sea level. For example, a station that was located 7, 000, or 5,000 feet above sea level with a, and their, their barometer reads 24.92 inches will report a sea level pressure reading of 29.92 inches. And uh, you can do some research on that, um, but that's not necessary to remember, except that it is adjusted for sea level. Um, by the way, by tracking barometric pressure across a large area, weather forecasters can, weather course forecasters can more accurately predict the movement of pressure systems and, and air masses and the weather associated with that. So that's very helpful. Um, the reason different. Um, weather reporting stations will have different altimeter settings. You no, know, it's just, just a conversion for a thousand feet for, or one inch for every thousand feet. But the difference is different altimeter settings caused by an unequal heating of the Earth's surface, which creates those different pressures for barometric settings. Right? Because the warmer it is, the thinner the air. You'll have a higher, you know, you'll have a different uh, barometric pressure. So, Basically, a lot, there'll be several questions about this. Uh, density altitude, high density altitude would reduce UAS performance. Warmer temperatures increase density altitude and reduce UAS performance. Right, this chart, is, this little picture here is just a good thing to help remind us what this does. Temperature goes up, or pressure going down, uh, It'll be as if we're flying at a higher altitude, even though we're on the ground. Again, the, the standards are 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees C and 29.92 millibars. There will be questions on that. And that's called a standard day. So here's the famous chart. We've worked through this a bunch of times. You shouldn't have any problem with this, but uh, just as a review, remember that these are the altimeter settings. So uh, whatever test question you've got, it'll tell you, you know, three zero. Uh, let's make one that's easy. Three zero. Where is it? Three zero down here. Three zero four zero. <laughs> um, temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, airport elevation 4,000 feet, MSL. So there's your three different, three different things that you require. So anyway, we go down to the altimeter setting, 3040, and that's right here. And it says subtract 440 feet, 440 feet from your um, airport elevation. So the air is actually th thicker than your airport. So you actually, the drone would be, be, would be performing better because you're going to be lower. All right, so we have to, we all have to do now is subtract 440 from 4,000. Um, what do we get? We get 3560. 
um, pressure. Altitude, right? Um, so that's our pressure altitude. All right, these lines over here, they indicate pressure altitude. So we need to find 3560. Uh, there's three. So 35, we'll just say 35, that's halfway. So there should be a line going like this. All right, that's one way to do it. And we go to temperature 80 degrees, which is here. Remember that we want to find which scale. Is it Fahrenheit or is it centigrade? It's Fahrenheit. That's on the test question. So then we go, oh, see these little lines here? It's sort of hard to see. You go up that line, you whoop, whoop, hit that line. A little straighter would have been nice. Then you go straight across. And by the way, you can have a straight, you know, a piece of paper or something just to use it a straight edge so you don't have to make squiggly lines like me. Then you go from here, you go, whoops, you try to go straight. You go, <laughs> That's pretty bad. But you go straight over there and you see the answer is, okay, and these are, read what it says, read what it says, approximate density altitude. So you're finding the density altitude. So your aircraft today, because of the hot temperature, is going to think you're, uh, you know, and the, the answers are going to be far enough away where you can take a little bit of an extrapolation because it's sort of hard to tell, because especially because of my line here. I would say it's 5,500, don't you think? I think I'm right about 5,000. DA, density altitude, 5,500 density altitude. So your aircraft is going to think it's at 5,500 feet. That's the point. So the question answers are going to be 5,500 feet, 6,500 feet, 2,500 feet, something like that. And you just get the closest one. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Um, the only thing I might remind you of again is when it says factor, any chart that you find says factor, that's what you do to another number. It's a factor. So in this case, it has a minus or a plus. Uh, so you can see uh, when it says 2992, it's a zero factor. Why is that? Well, because that's standard. And if you took 59 degrees, which would be, or 15 degrees, that's standard. So if you on a normal day, you would go up here and then you go straight over and you'd fit 4,000 feet because it's standard. Standard, standard, standard. It would be um, pressure altitude um, and uh, density altitude on a standard day will be the same, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, no, again, this should not be confusing at this point. So I think that's about it. Uh, so performance is worse in this particular example. I'll keep going on. Here's an example question. Um, how would high density altitude affect the performance of a small unmanned aircraft? Well, you can rephrase this to say if the outside air temperature at a given altitude is warmer than standard, then the density altitude would be would be higher than pressure altitude. So it would be a high would be a decrease in performance, right? That should be easy, right? It's high density altitude. High means thinner, high density altitude. Um, another way to say it might be um, which factor would tend to increase the density altitude at a given airport referenced in the weather briefing? Um, Increase in barometric pressure? No, that's thicker air. Increase in ambient temperature? That's reasonable. Increase in or decrease in relative humidity. Now we haven't talked about relative humidity, but you do recall that that does the moister the air is, the further apart the molecules are, the thinner the air is. So humidity does affect density altitude. In fact, the more humid the air, the thinner the air is. So this answer says decrease relative humidity. No, it's got to be increase in temperature. Um, other factors that w might affect besides uh, density altitude, that's the major factor. But there's other factors as well that may affect the performance of a drone. Uh, how about local winds? Um, if you're flying around uh, taller buildings and the wind is uh, uh, could swirl around these buildings and cause 
controllability errors, um, lots of tur local turbulence from buildings or even trees or definitely mountains if we're in, that, in those kind of areas. Um, downtown Atlanta uh, can be a difficult place to fly simply because all these buildings and the wind swirls around the buildings and so that's an issue. Um, here's one question that they have while operating around buildings. Remote PI said should be aware of the creation of wind gusts that change rapidly and speed cause uh, may cause tab turbulence. It does not enhance stability. It doesn't increase the performance of the aircraft. It's got to be number A, letter A. Other factors, wind shear. Wind shear is the, uh, where the wind at different altitudes will be changing directions. Uh, wind shear is simply a sudden drastic change in the wind speed or direction over a sort of a small or a very small area. Uh, so wind shear can subject an aircraft to violent updrafts and downdrafts and as well as changes in the horizontal movement of the aircraft. So while wind shear can occur, can occur at any altitude, um, the low level wind shear is especially hazardous because of the proximity of the aircraft to the ground, obviously. Low level wind shear is commonly associated with passing frontal systems, thunderstorms, temperature inversions, uh, strong upper uh, level winds as well. So that's something that, that will affect the performance of a U.S. The most severe kind of wind shear uh, it would be a, what we call a microburst, typically from a thunderstorm, the rain shaft, is, uh, especially a mature or dissipating thunderstorm when there's these rain shafts that are, you know, rain of course is heavy and it's falling and it's pulling air down with it. Um, it's, it's the most severe kind of wind shear, of course. Um, Typical microburst will have a horizontal diameter of one to two miles and perhaps a thousand feet of altitude. Lifespan of a microburst is about five to 15 minutes, uh, at which time it can produce downdrafts of up to 5,000 or 6,000 feet per minute. And headwind and, and tailwinds uh, between 30 and 90 knots. So seriously, a serious issue for a drone for sure, way beyond its capability to recover from. So a, a microburst could blow your drone right into a building or into the ground. Um, so during a microburst encounter, your small UAV may first uh, experience a performance increasing headwind followed by downdraft, followed by a rapidly increasing tailwinds. So it'd just be very difficult and most likely you know, have some kind of impact with the ground or some other uh, obstacle. Uh, a short discussion on atmospheric stability again. Review your notes on this. Stability of the atmosphere depends on its ability to resist vertical motion. Remember we talked about uh, uneven heating of the Earth's surface and then some, sometimes we'll have these warm, Earth will, the Sun will heat the Earth up and there'll be these parcels of warm air that start rising and they as air rises it cools when it gets uh, if, if it's always warmer than the air around it it will just keep rising and rising and rising it's unstable if it rises and reaches equilibrium as it cools temperature of the air parcel and temperature of the surrounding air are the same it's stable and it stops rising that's stability Stability of the atmosphere depends on its ability to resist that vertical motion. Stable atmosphere makes vertical movement difficult, and small vertical disturbances dampen out and disappear. But in an unstable atmosphere, these small uh, vertical air movements tend to become larger. Instability can lead to significant turbulence, uh, clouds, severe weather. But it's not just these warm air par parcels rising, it's also it could be off of a, a wind blowing up a, a mountain slope, could be pushing this warm air up higher. Um, there's a convergence between several um, air masses bumping into each other. There's a number of reasons why this air might rise besides just um, convective currents from uneven heating. But at any rate, uh, moisture also has something to do with it as well. A combination of moisture and temperature determine the stability of air and the resulting kind of weather. Cool, dry air is very stable and does resist, tends to resist vertical movement, which leads to good and generally clear weather. 
Um, but greater instability occurs when the air is moist and warm, as, for example, in tropical regions in the summer. How we measure that? How do we measure that? We measure it by lapse rate. Lapse rate is uh, the rate at which the atmosphere atmospheric bi uh, variability, normal temperature in the Earth's atmosphere, falls with altitude. In other words, as the uh, as the air parcel rises for whatever reason, uh, it decreases. Like I said, and then when it reaches equilibrium, it stops rising. Lapse rate arises from uh, the word lapse in the sense of a gradual fall. In dry air, the adiabatic lapse rate is 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet. So every 1,000 feet, you lose a little, a little over almost 5.5 degrees of Fahrenheit. But the moist adiabatic lapse rate, on the other hand, is the rate at which a saturated parcel of air warms or cools when it is moved vertically. Lapse rate of approximately 3.3 .3 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet of vertical movement in moist air. So uh, the basic principle here, again, for your answering your question is rising air cools, sinking air warms, always. Uh, so let's look at a question for atmospheric stability. Here it is. What measurement can be used to determine the stability? determine the stability of the atmosphere. It's the actual lapse rate. Term determines whether or not it's stable or not. So the importance, of course, is stable atmosphere will be fairly good weather without, thunder generally speaking, without thunderstorms and severe weather. Whereas an unstable atmosphere is going to tend to increase the vertical movement of air forming cumulonimbus rain clouds, and thunderstorms, along with weather that may be associated with that. Here's another example of a question related to this. Um, combination of moisture, what, what weather provides the best flying conditions, generally speaking, cool, dry air? Yeah, makes sense. Cool, dry air is very stable and resists uh, vertical movement, which generally leads to good and, and clear weather. Um, what are the characteristics of stable air? Okay, all right. Stable air um, around a frontal system tends to uh, produce uh, poor visibility and steady precipitation as well. Another question: Upon your pre-flight evaluation of whether the forecast you reference states there is an unstable air mass approaching location, which would not be a concern for your uh, impending operation. So remember, unstable air masses are uh, tend towards turbulent condition and th thunderstorms, so you obviously eliminate those. It tends to be stratiform clouds. As you can see on the left hand, it says normal conditions, warm air just rises until it reaches equilibrium. On a stable day, it'll reach equilibrium. On an unstable day, the warmer air will continue to be uh, to rise through the uh, cooler air. But uh, occasionally, there is a there is an anomaly where we'll have what they call a temperature inversion, and uh, things sort of different. And uh, it really came to our notion uh, back in the 60s and 70s when we would notice large cities uh, with these unusually uh, polluted, polluted air and smoggy kind of weather uh, that sort of gets trapped underneath these, these areas when there's a lot of pollution being emitted. Um, but when the temperature of the air rises with altitude, a temperature inversion increases. The surrounding air, right? Um, inversion layers are common shallow, shallow layers of smooth, stable air close to the ground. Temperature of the air increases with, the with altitude to a certain point, which is the top of the inversion. At the top of the inversion, uh, there's a layer that acts like a lid, keeping weather and pollutants trapped. If the relative humidity of the air is high, it can contribute to the formation of clouds, fog, haze, or smoke uh, resulting, 
resulting in a diminished visibility in the inversion layer. Surface-based temperature inversions can also occur on clear, cool nights when the air close to the ground is cooled by the lowering temperature of the ground. The air within a few hundred feet of the surface, in other words, uh, will become uh, cooler than the air above it. Frontal inversions also occur when warm air spreads over a large cooler air or cooler air is forced under a layer of warmer air. Uh, temperature dew point relationship. Uh, recall that when temperature and dew point come together, that means the air is saturated. In other words, 100% uh, humid, uh, humidity. Uh, that's just the point where the air can no longer hold its moisture. It must turn into uh, some sort of visible moisture like uh, fog, low clouds, um, frost, if it's cold enough, rain, or snow, that kind of thing. And we've talked about that before, is as warm moisture ascends into the atmosphere, because it's warmer, it goes up to a certain point. And when it gets close together, it can no longer hold, hold its moisture. That's where we see these layers of clouds. Uh, but temperature dew point is, generally speaking, what it is on the uh, surface. It's a surface report that we'll read. We will give us information about the uh, relative humidity. When they both those temperatures come close together, we know that there's a possibility of some sort of restriction in visibility, like fog. Uh, you have four ways that that can happen. Uh, you have, might have warm air moving over a cold surface. We have the Gulf of Mexico, or Gulf of Mexico. We have the Gulf Stream that moves up from uh, the equator, moves up past uh, uh, New England, partially, creates some of our great fisheries up there. But as that warm air, if it blows over uh, below freezing ground surfaces, um, that the temperature, moist air, temperature drops pretty rapidly, and you have a, you'll have some kind of a fog. So we'll have sea fog up in the northeast United States. Of course, it happens out west, uh, around California as well. Uh, second reason would be the saturate, uh, the saturation point may be reached. Saturation point, I mean the dew point and the temperature and dew point come together and the air is saturated with moisture and can no longer hold it when cold air and warm air mix together in a frontal system. Third, sometimes at night, sometimes at night um, when the air will cool through contact with a cooler ground surface, air may reach its saturation point. We often see fog at night or even in the morning when we wake up usually because we don't stay up all night. But We'll see that because uh, the sun heating the Earth's surface um, the surface cools fairly rapidly once the sun stops shining on the Earth's surface at night and it cools. Fourth method where we might see uh, air becoming saturated would be uh, when air is lifted or forced upward in the atmosphere. That's what I was talking about with the cloud layers. But it can also happen with uh, uh, what we call uh, upslope fog, which would be ground here. And then, oh, there's a mountain over here, and this warm air is blowing up the hill, and whoop, as, it, as the temperature decreases, it comes to the temperature dew point. And rain falls, or it just turns into a fog, or a cloud. You've seen mountains with clouds nearby. That's what that is. Those are the four methods. Okay, we need to talk about dew and frost as well. That'll be maybe on the on the uh, exam questions about that. Again, cool on a cool, clear, calm night, temperature of the ground because no longer any solar heating. Temperature of the ground and objects on the surface can cause temperature of the surrounding air to drop below the dew point. This occurs that moisture in the air uh, condenses and deposits up on the ground, buildings, other objects like cars and airplanes. This moisture is known as dew, of course. We all are familiar with that. See the grass and other objects in the morning when you get up. If the, but if the temperature is below freezing, the moisture uh, is deposited in the form of frost. Dew doesn't pose any kind of threat to a small UA, but frost uh, possesses a, or poses a definite flight safety hazard. Now, it's unlikely you're going to leave your 
drone out overnight in the backyard. In airplanes, that happens all the time, not in the backyard, but it gets left outside and you end up with frost on the wings and you have to clear all that off before you can go flying. So, But still, the FAA wants you to know that if you were to leave your drone out and it had frost on it, or if you just had an extended period of time where you sat, your drone sat out while you get ready to go, it could start to form ice. So ice, or frost, disrupts the airflow over the propeller blades, so it's not going to produce the right, the correct amount of lift. Plus, it's heavy. It does weigh something. So now your drone becomes heavier. So it can definitely uh, adversely affect the ability to take off. Your small UA must be thoroughly cleaned and free of frost before the beginning of flight. Air masses and cold front. We need to discuss this as well. <laughs> um, air masses move out of their source regions. Uh, so out of Canada, we get these uh, cold air masses, continental air masses that move towards the southeast, and they clash with the maritime tropical air masses coming up from the Gulf of Mexico and from the Atlantic. And uh, so they're, all of these air masses are moving. They're affected by uh, different pressures, and they're affected by Coriolis effect as they move. Um, anytime the zone between two different air masses we call a frontal zone or a front. And across this zone, temperature, of course, humidity, of course, and wind often changes rapidly over fairly short distances. Another way to look at this is a front is simply a zone of differing, differing air masses with different characteristics. Like I said, the Canadian continental air mass is dry, cold and dry. The tropical maritime, well, it could be a Pacific tropical maritime coming up from the Pacific. It's going to be moist. Um, that, in that case, probably from the Pacific, it's moist and cool as well, but uh, probably warmer than the Canadian air mass. But anyway, different temperature, different humidity, different wind directions as well. Um, so the, uh, the easiest way really to recognize as you're going about your daily life, to recognizing a different front is the temperature discon discontinuity. Or the, the, the discontinuity is just another word for the different characteristics between part of something. So temperature is the big change uh, and the way you know when a front has passed by, either colder or warmer. Frontal systems will all present a change in wind direction from one side of the front to the other as well. Uh, differing air masses in their frontal zones bring clashes between this warm, these warm air masses and cold air, between moist and dry air. All these clashes present opportunities for instability, where, again, moist, warm air is pushed up, which produce rain and low clouds. And if the vertical push of warm air up is strong enough, severe weather. Um, but in some cases, warm, moist air gently moves over colder air and produces fog and other weather phenomena like that. So when we talk about these fronts, uh, air masses and fronts, we start with the cold front. And this is basically uh, one good example would be the Canadian air mass moving to the southeast of the United States. The, the thing we experience a lot this time of year, right? Cold air is denser than warm air, so it has uh, generally moves faster because it pushes, it has more energy to push the warm out of the way, warm air out of the way. And the faster it moves, the faster this warm air has to get out of the way and rise. It's being pushed up. That's why cold air or cold fronts generally produce more, generally tend to produce more severe weather like thunderstorms and tornadoes and all those things. Uh, but as you can see, uh, cloud development, you get lots of cloud development uh, immediately before the uh, cold front because the moist air is being pushed, the warm air is being pushed up to the point where it can no longer hold its moisture and it needs to condense into something like clouds and rain. Uh, so general, again, generally speaking, uh, cold fronts produce more severe weather depending on the stability of the air still. Uh, the moisture content of the warmer air is being displaced and the speed of the frontal movement. To expect a lot of vertical air movement, including thunderstorms, icing, 
heavy rain, rapid changes in wind, and dropping temperatures in a cold front. Now we have warm front to consider, warm air because it's less dense than colder air, then the colder that it's trying to displace, warm fronts tend to move slow and produce longer-lived weather phenomena. Uh, generally speaking, warm fronts will produce longer periods of showery type precipitation. Lower visibility, such as fog, also high cirrus clouds will often precede uh, the front, right? We have all these high cirrus clouds, so you'll be knowing when a warm front is coming uh, quite, quite a while beforehand. Um, we still see warm, moist air being pushed up, of course, so cumulonimbus, that is rain clouds, and thunderstorms are still possible and likely. Um, if the underlying cold air is below freezing, some of this rain will fall as snow or sleet. Uh, you know, right? If this is below freezing in these areas, right, we're going to have uh, perhaps some sleet and cold frozen precipitation in these areas as well. Um, freezing rain especially is a very serious concern for a drone pilot because it accumulates on your aircraft very rapidly. Uh, again, weather phenomena, uh, all of these particular issues, uh, rain, low clouds, freezing rain, uh, they could recur quite a while, quite a distance ahead of the front. Uh, Um, all right, uh, question here. The presence of ice pellets at the surface evidence, evidence that there's a temperature inversion with freezing rain at a higher altitude. Ice pellets always indicate freezing rain at a higher altitude, right? Because the rain is falling and uh, turning and freezing as it falls. Um, let's see, fog, we need to discuss fall br fog briefly, uh, you know, when humidity and uh, uh, reaches 100% or the dew point coincides with the temperature, uh, the air becomes saturated and some, that's some side of uh, visible moisture is going to appear. The colder the temperature, the less moisture it may hold, of course. We mentioned that already. The warmer air, the more moisture it may contain. So. Um, and as air cools, as it expands, it cools. As air is compressed, it warms. Um, cloud, clouds, fog, or dew always appear when weather vapor condenses. So if air is cooled by other factors, it will also condense into visible moisture. For example, in the case of fog, generally it's close proximity with the earth or some kind of cold or cold earth or cold water for that matter cause, may cause this moist air to reach the dew point and fog will appear. Um, fog requires very light or no wind to form. The air needs time to cool off as it comes in contact with the either the colder water or colder uh, earth. Um, and if you have a good bout of wind, it's going to keep the air mixed and lift up whatever moisture uh, that the air may contain. So uh, sort of the common factors in fog. We have different kinds of fog, of course. We have different kinds of uh, fog. That there will be specific questions about these as well. Advection fog is simply when a lower, a low layer of warm, moist air moves over a cooler surface. It will require a light amount of wind in order to, uh, because you've got to move warm, moist air over a cooler surface. So the classic example would be uh, the uh, off onshore breeze from uh, warmer water over a cooler surface. And we mentioned that before, uh, the Gulf Stream and the New England in the wintertime, uh, as, uh, as you have a slight breeze blowing this wind over the land, it will turn into fog. Uh, it's uh, requires just a light wind. A heavy, a lot of wind is going to disturb the, disturb it and not allow for fog. So if, if it's a foggy morning, you pray for lots of wind to blow it away, to clear your air so you can go flying. Or you wait a little while and the temperature warms up and the sun warms it up and it holds more moisture and it clears up. 
Uh, here we go. In which situation is advection fog most likely to form? An air mass moving inland from the coast in winter. Basically what I was saying. A warm tropical air mass moving over a uh, colder land mass is going to likely form advection fog. Now we have upslope fog, and I'll give you a couple of guesses what that means. Uh, yeah, that just means air is blowing. This is probably more likely, well, a good example would be San Francisco as the uh, Pacific Ocean, moist water, moist air. Uh, if the wind is blowing towards the shore and pushes up on the hills because there's hills and all kinds of uplifting there, you'll, it'll form fog up in these hills because the moist air is rising and as it rises it cools and as it cools it, the air can hold less moisture so uh, the moisture will condense into clouds or in this case fog what type of fog depend on wind in order to uh, to uh, exist Advection fog and upslope fog, two kinds of kind, two kinds of fog that require a little bit of wind. How are you going to blow the moist air up this hill? You got to have a little bit of wind. Um, question A or answer A is incorrect because radiation fog and ice fog do not depend on wind in order to exist. Uh, answer B is incorrect because ground fog does not depend on wind in order to exist. But advection and upslope upslope require uh, wind. All right, then we have uh, steam fog. Uh, type of fog forms when water vapor is added to the air by evaporation and mixes with cooler, drier air. Uh, steam fog typically forms in the winter when cold, dry air passes from land over the warmer waters. Now, airframe icing and turbulence may occur if the cooler air is below freezing. Remember that the one necessary condition for structural icing is the presence of visible moisture. And again, structural icing is you're flying along and your airplane starts to accumulate ice. As it accumulates ice, it gets heavier and the airfoils, the propeller blades, uh, are their shape is changed because the ice doesn't form evenly all the way across the propeller blade, it goes to the leading edge, so you lose lift and it gets heavier. Uh, if you are not in the clouds, you will not get structural icing. How far from the clouds are UAS operations allowed to get? Well, you should know that answer. Uh, but if you stay out of the clouds, you're not going to get steam fog. Um, radiation fog. Um, the conditions that are favorable for radiation fog are clear skies, no wind, and very small temperature dew point spreads with a high relative humidity day. Radiation fog is restricted to land because water surfaces cool little from nighttime radiation. So radiation fog is a... Uh, Okay, here's a sample question about radiation fog. Uh, what situation is most conductive to the formation of radiation fog? Uh, answer B, moist tropical air moving over cold offshore, offshore water. No, it doesn't form over water. I just said that. C, movement of cold air over much warmer water. Nope, not, doesn't form over water. It's gotta be A. Warm, moist air over low flatland areas on clear, calm nights is the answer to this one. All right. Um, I'm going to end the uh, uh, presentation at this point. It's fairly long already. Uh, I'm sorry about the length of it. Hopefully you can break it up and watch portions of it as a review. This is review, of course. This is material we've already covered. Uh, we're going to start another, and I'm going to put another video up about thunderstorms and severe weather uh, phenomena which will be part of this actually, but uh, just to divide this thing up a little bit so it's not so long. Remember that you need to read through the, especially the weather material uh, in chapter 3B of the FAA publication, Small Unmanned Aircraft System Study Guide. This study guide will be very helpful to you. Uh, listen, look, read.
that's what's going to be necessary for you to pass this exam. Uh, get down, by the way, the study guide's downloadable. It's free from the F, from uh, FAA.gov. Uh, just do a search FAA.gov, Small Unmanned Aircraft System Study Guide, and, and read it over. They have a whole section and explain these things as well. So uh, that's part of your job is to check that out. So uh, the end of this video, and then we're going to go on with uh, thunderstorms and severe weather phenomena.